welcome to everybody who's uh, joined us today uh, on behalf of uh, all member organizations of the Global Alliance Cities for Children and Save the Children. Uh, we're very excited to host this dialogue uh, today on the very important topic of uh, improving uh, urban air quality for children with very practical uh, ideas from different countries around the world. We're joined by very exciting set of speakers from all over the world. I'm going to let Sarah introduce them in a bit. But just to start off by um, telling you a little bit uh, about Alliance, uh, childhood uh, today is mostly lived and experienced in urban areas, in cities and in towns around the world. Uh, and therefore, we got together as an alliance uh, to collectively champion the rights, the well being, the health, the safety uh, of children uh, in urban areas and in cities around the world. Our name is a bit of a shorthand for our concerns. Uh, we are concerned with children and young people uh, more broadly. Uh, and today we are 27 member organizations, uh, very different types of organizations, international NGOs, UN agencies, the private sector, academia, foundations, people's, people's movements and others uh, collaborating uh, in order to advance uh, children's rights and well-being in cities and urban areas. Uh, the Alliance is uh, managed and led by Save the Children's Global Urban Hub, which is based at Save the Children in Switzerland. And our ethos, all of us, is to collaborate for impact for children growing up uh, in cities and urban areas. And central to our concerns uh, are the children in cities uh, who experience the most marginalization, inequality, and discrimination. Collectively, between the 27 members of the Alliance, we work in perhaps most of the countries around the world. And we have a wide range of expertise on a broad range of topics from child health, survival, nutrition, protection, air pollution, urban planning, street design, road safety, safety for girls, and many, many more. We're a very young alliance, but also very dynamic uh, and ambitious. And you can learn about our work via our website, www.cities4children.org. I just want to point you uh, to a few things uh, on our website. Uh, the first is the Knowledge Hub. Um, uh, which is, you can find two things on the Knowledge Hub. One is our own research series, uh, where we have seven publications, we produced seven publications over the past year, uh, as part of our research series, Cities for Children and Youth, one of which is uh, co-authored by Sarah West, who's moderating the session today. And um, we have on the Knowledge Hub also um, uh, collected a series of practical resources that are relevant for a range of topics to work on topics relevant to children, youth and cities. Uh, we also have a very active blog, which has a, a range of shorter uh, content. Um, next slide, please, Nikita. Uh, a range of short, uh, shorter content about a lot of different topics, including about uh, air pollution. The best way uh, to stay updated with our work as an alliance is to go visit our website, uh, subscribe to our newsletter. We're very active also on uh, various social media channels where we announce oral publications, events, blogs, upcoming calls. We have exciting plans uh, coming up, so uh, please stay tuned. If you have any questions uh, about the Global Alliance Cities for Children, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Dr. Sarah West, who will be moderating today's session, introducing the speakers and telling us more about the sources of air pollution. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. So hi, everybody. I'm Sarah West. I'm director of the Stockholm Environment Institute York Centre, which is at the University of York. And I'm a citizen science researcher, which means I design and run and evaluate projects where the public get involved in scientific research. I'm involved in quite a few air quality projects, including SAMI, which is Schools Air Monitoring for Health and Education, which is just starting in the UK. And that's looking at air quality in schools. So I'm really excited to be here today hosting this session about improving urban air quality for children. And as Sarah said, we're going to be discussing sources of air pollution, how it can affect children and their families. And then we're going to be moving on to discussing what can be done about it through a series of really interesting case studies. So the webinar has been designed to be interactive. So please have a think about questions you'd like to ask about the topic. So to kick us off, I'd like you to tell us about air quality in the city that you live, work in or visit. So we're going to do a quick little poll, which Nikita, I hope, is going to work some Zoom magic and should come up on your 
screen shortly. Um, so yes, yeah, so thinking about a city that you um, live in, that you work in, or that you visit, tell us about um, what you think about air pollution levels in your city. So you've got various options here. So is air quality in your city a health concern? So you've got not really, the air quality is good, moderate, the air quality is satisfi satisfactory, unhealthy, very unhealthy, health risks for all, hazardous emergency conditions, or there's also a don't know option. Um, so if you could um, just pop those in, it's very exciting. I can see the numbers going up um, as you're filling them in. Um, so we're just going to give it a little bit longer for uh, some more people to um, wait for those little numbers to stabilise. OK. Fabulous. I think probably we will end the poll there. And if we can see the results, let's have a bit of a look at those. OK, so hopefully you can see there that the cities that we're living in, we don't think it have great air quality. So we've got um, a few people saying that it's hazardous or very unhealthy, so healthy risks, health risks for everyone. Quite a lot of people in the unhealthy and the moderate air quality. Um, and I think that's one person who said that they think they've got um, good air quality. So as you can see from wherever you are in the world, that we've all got issues um, with the air quality and we need to do something about it. So I hope that this webinar will give you some inspiration of things that you can do. Fabulous. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce a problem for you. And then I'm going to talk about some of the sources of air pollution in urban areas, particularly thinking about the global south. Um, but first of all, I'd like to get an idea of who we've got in the audience and what your knowledge about air pollution and its impacts on health are. So I think Nikita has got a second poll um, to share with you, um, which asks you about how you would rate your knowledge of the effects of air pollution on children. So we've got little or no knowledge, expert or somewhere in between. Fabulous, thanks everybody. All right, so a few more things in the poll, if you could just, this isn't such a popular poll. Maybe nobody knows. Maybe they don't know how expert they are. Okay. All right, I think we might just give it a few more seconds. So if you haven't completed that second poll, if you could, that would be wonderful. If anyone is struggling to complete the poll, just let us know. You can do that via the chat screen. We'll be using the chat screen to take questions as well. So the chat screen is down at the bottom um, of, your, of your screen. Looks like a little speech bubble. So if you wanted to do that, if you're having any issues, just let us know. Um, OK, fabulous. I think we'll um, probably end that poll there. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so um, hopefully you'll see in a minute we've got most people are in the kind of somewhere in between category. Um, OK, so I'm going to give it a bit of an introduction now um, to air pollution. Um, so what it is and um, the effects that it has on children. So air pollution is a global health issue. According to the World Health Organization, every day around 93% of the world's children under 19 breathe air that is so polluted that it puts their health and development at risk. And it has all sorts of effects. It can increase the likelihood of childhood asthma. It can stunt lung growth. It can increase the risk of chest infections and it can even lead to heart disease and increase risk of diabetes. And there are also links to neurocognitive outcomes such as autism spectrum disorders and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And children, the elderly and those with pre-existing heart or lung cardiovascular diseases um, problems are particularly vulnerable to air pollution. For children, this is because their bodies are still developing and so they inhale more air per unit of body weight than adults. And air pollution isn't just causing illnesses, it's actually causing excess deaths. So it's ex estimated that 237,000 excess deaths each year, child's deaths each year, are due to ambient air pollution um, related respiratory tract infections. So what is air pollution and where does it come from? Well, air pollution is a mixture of gases and solid or liquid particles, which come from natural and human driven activities. What makes up the air pollution and how concentrated the pollution is depends on what the sources of air pollution are and also what the weather conditions are. Some of the pollutants which have health effects include nitrogen dioxide, 
sulfur dioxide, ozone, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, which are the things you can smell, um, and particulates or particles. So fine particulate matter, those which are less than two and a half micrometers in diameter can penetrate deep into the lungs and they can even enter the bloodstream. And that fine particulate matter comes from many different sources and could be come from, uh, can be composed of fine dusts, um, sea salt, secondary aerosols, which are formed from chemical reactions, and importantly, combustion, um, both natural and human made processes. And combustion sources are particularly worrying from a health perspective. So air pollution is classified as either indoor or outdoor. However, the outdoor air pollution levels can affect the indoor air quality and um, vice versa. So there are natural sources of air pollution, such as desert dust, but air pollution most often comes from human activity, including incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and biomass, such as in transport, households, industries, and to generate electricity. Other sources of air pollution emissions include um, the mismanagement of waste and agricultural processes, such as applying fertilizers, managing manure and burning crop residues. And some of the sources of indoor air pollution include cooking practices, heating and lighting in the home, chemicals from cleaning fluids or other products and smoking. And from the, for the world's poorest and most vulnerable, they tend to be on the front line of air pollution. And this is partly due to the location of affordable housing and informal settlements, which are often really close to industrial zones and busy congested roads. And those roads are often dusty, which the dust is then kicked up when buses and lorries roll past. And in addition, in these communities, poor waste management infrastructure results in local burning of plastic waste and e-waste, so that's electrical or electronic equipment waste. And consequently, residents can be exposed to high levels of outdoor pollution. And in these communities, indoor air pollution is also an issue with air pollution coming from the use of biomass or coal in overcrowded and poorly ventilated housing, which contributes to high rates of respiratory illness, particularly in young children. And a study of cities in India found that children who live in informal settlements had negative health effects from air pollution, three times that of children living outside of informal settlements. So the case studies that we're going to hear today are really interesting. I've had a bit of a sneak preview of them. Um, so we're first going to hear from Richard. Um, so we're going to hear from Richard about citizens making their own air sensors. Jack is going to talk about UNICEF's work on monitoring and improving air quality in Mongolia. But first of all, we're going to hear from Loretto about air quality in Latin America and some of the actions that are being taken to improve the situation. So please write any questions you have about the presentations in the chat screen as you think of them. And I'll read them out at the end, along with some that we have received in advance. So off you go, Loretto, when you're when you're ready, please do share your screen. Hello, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. We can see your screen and we can hear you really nicely. Thank you. So happy to be here, guys. Thank you so much. A day after blue sky. So this I'm going to show you Aires Nuevos, which means fresh air. Uh, so basically, this is Citizen Air Quality Network for Early Childhood. And we try to bring give a face to this invisible problem, which is air pollution. Uh, we deploy uh, low-cost monitors where children play and, and learn, basically, and we measure particulate matter and uh, CO2. This, is, this uh, information comes in real time. So basically, you see all these pictures where we are deploying the sensors. Um, and uh, this is because air pollution is a global health emergency. Uh, you know that in... Uh, the burden of the dis diseases or and, and the problems with the pollutions are more in low and middle income countries. And I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna go through all this uh, data, but I'm just showing uh, to you so you can see what's going on in Latin America. That basically almost all our children are breathing a toxic air. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the social determinants of health. This is the worst. 
And there is a, so, a global, uh, significant uh, global variation risk of fatality uh, from air pollution up to 14% in developing countries. Okay, so you see uh, Latin America and it's between um, five to 7.5 and in Asia, it can come up to uh, 14. But this is basically as a huge gap in monitoring system. And if you can see even uh, in the South uh, area of, um, in the South Hemisphere, I'm sorry, uh, there is almost an even amount of government air quality monitoring station and independently operated ones. And of the 33 Latin American countries, only 27% of them have a robust and permanent monitoring system. So basically, we, with this project, Aires Nuevos, we try to reframe air pollution on early childhood development. And we work in a collaborative work uh, with the uh, community, universities, and municipality, and also with the work of different stakeholders that work in the public policy uh, arena. So we try to bring a collaborative work to create community-driven uh, data inform our local plans for the community. So basically, here's the map where you can see where we are deployed at. Uh, we work with 14 universities, we are in 42 cities, and uh, if you can see, basically, we are uh, measuring um, uh, the, the, the air, what children are bringing in preschools, but it depends on every city where they would like to see uh, and check how the, 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 quality, the air quality is uh, in, in, uh, around the kids, okay? So for example, Lima, as I will show you, decided to put these sensors in Foster's homes. So we have been measuring uh, around more than a year. And in Latin America, the major dry, uh, driver air quality issues are the no, almost no urban planning tools or very and very fast urbanization, vehicle emissions, wood burning, okay? And all this data that is, uh, is taken from, uh, um, from our monitors, you can see that uh, we are not attaining what the World Organiz uh, Health Organization is telling us to protect our children's lungs. So basically we try to measure, we measure and in order to act. So this is a grassroots effort. We start deploying the sensors. We come up with different stakeholders that work together. We do air quality trainings. The data analysis are, uh, developed by the, the academia. Uh, this is shared to the community and to the local governments. We do community awareness campaigns. And I'm gonna stop in the local action uh, for air quality that I'm gonna show you different um, uh, examples that we have been working on. We are working in eight cities, and but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you only two or three, okay? So, um, the sustainable air pollution reduction, pla reduction plans, if we have a focus on early childhood or, ch or, or on children's development, we're going to have a beautiful city and a very nice city uh, for everybody, right? But this requires an alignment in social and economic realities communities too. So these are going to show, what I'm going to show you is like local actions plans that are um, low cost, but try, can be scalable, okay? So Coyhaique. Coyhaique is a city in the Patagonia here, Chile, in the south. Oh, everybody will see, oh, it's Patagonia, very beautiful. But of course, wood burning is the main force, uh, uh, fuel to uh, cook and to um, heat the homes. So when you go to the data, you see this is the Chilean standard. It's 50 uh, microgram per meter uh, cubic in um, uh, for the daily daily average, you you know that it, uh, World Organ uh, uh, Health Organization is twenty. So in winter time, we almost all day from midnight to uh, midnight, all the twenty four hours, you are above what is recommended. And this is summertime. Uh, this is summertime, and this is winter. So uh, I put it in, the, in the, the wrong way, but here you can see a window that the children can do, can 
exercise outside without compromising their lung, uh, their lungs and their health. So basically, this with the uh, with the training, the same teachers have, have come with a, a signal to check how the air quality is that day, so children can know they change the the signal every time the air quality uh, is modified uh, they came up with a no idling campaign and they also do a lot of activities for the community educational ones lima for example they have five different places where they are measuring and if you see all the pollution source sources are related to solid waste vehicle emissions bare soils where you, there is dust around so here is, for example, one area which is called Morales Duares, and they see that uh, the PM 2.5 uh, concentration in winter uh, is the worst. It's become 30 and 100 micro microgram uh, per uh, meter cubic. Uh, so, uh, and the hours are better in the uh, before noon, uh, in the noon between noon, uh, noon and eight. So they came up with. A mitigation plan, which is eliminating critical areas of, of accumulation, solid waste, planting vegetation, signage of uh, no idling zones. So here we have two schools in this area with that is attending to 800 children, and they are coming with, they check where are the critical points, where are the areas that they have to intervene, which is the, the pink one, they're going to do like a school route. So different type of interventions to bring uh, the city back to the children. So one of them, for example, we have this is Republica Canada, one of the schools, they come up with a design, with the prototype, and they start to avoid this. For example, this is for the dust uh, removal. They start uh, limiting the area and also doing some plantings and uh, some um, urban interventions. This is another case study where daily average of particular matter, especially course one in this um, school is bringing really high um, values according to the in Peruvian index, air quality index. They, so they transformed, they, they saw that the dust was bringing a lot of bad air, air uh, pollution. So they transformed the space to prevent rising dust. And this is before and this is after. Also, in the same area, they decided to make a vegetation buffer and they brought all the, the, the community together so the solution can be uh, more uh, sustainable over time. Here, the same, uh, in the same area, they came up with uh, coloring, with calming zones for children, with murals. So what, this is bringing not only uh, commitment, but everybody around the school are, are being benefited. These are other different uh, interventions that are being driven by the by um, science. So Quito, for example, uh, they have uh, a lot of dust coming, especially during the um, during the day in, at, at noon. So they are starting to uh, reforesting this. Um, this uh, hill that is bringing all the dust to the to the school in Monterey area, they are implementing tactile urbanism designs through painting. So they are bringing uh, the space back to the children, the, uh, making it more pedestrian, and the city low emission zones and idling as uh, zones around preschool and Quilmes Argentina. They have uh, many problems also with um, with a soccer um, uh, field that is bringing that. So they are doing a reforestation, a vegetation uh, um, wall, and in installing a vertical garden. So they also uh, bring children back to the, the, the playing with the dirt and uh, to make them understand the, the importance of food and, uh, of course, sovereignty and security in a healthy eating. Um, so future work of um, this uh, project, uh, we will we are uh, expanding our um, network. We are trying to benefit, of course, more children 
Uh, we do believe that the sustainable changes start in local communities. So we, we keep working, especially uh, in, in communities uh, with different awareness campaigns and also uh, um, citizen science projects. And uh, we uh, are pushing to crowdsourcing research in this hyper-local environment to do uh, more scalable air quality mitigation policy, especially. Uh, we actually, uh, in Chile, we just had a referendum. Uh, we didn't, uh, they didn't vote okay, but uh, air, the air uh, quality was one of the articles that we push to be in that new constitution. Uh, hopefully, if we keep going with this uh, political um, referendum, uh, the air quality and the, the, the right, the human right to breathe a clean air is still in the in that in that piece of law um, and also what is our next step is to create this healthy children's zone and we are trying to push um, in, in the political arena uh, uh, to promote electric school buses so uh, children can move around uh, with uh, around the city from from their homes to schools without breeding uh, bad air pollution inside of these diesel boxes. So this is what is uh, fresh air, Iris Nuevos, and thank you so much for um, um, listening to me today. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Loretto. Um, that was that was absolutely fascinating and really lovely to see that the interventions that were designed by the community were not only hopefully going to help improve air quality, it actually looks beautiful as well. You like that greening of those areas. That was really lovely to see those images. Thank you. I have one specific question for you that's come in the chat. We'll save the rest for later, but a point of clarification. And um, what kind of indoor environments are you measuring? Is it schools and homes or was it just schools? Oh, is we measure, yeah, we measure outside. Uh, we don't measure inside the schools. We are trying to bring up with different local actions plan that action uh, plans outside schools. So okay. also, you know, to to show, uh, and I know it's something as you were saying, vice versa. Okay, indoor and uh, but we are uh, actually protecting them uh, from outside. So yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you. So we're going to head across um, to um, Richard now, who's from Open Cities Lab. Um, so share your slides when you're ready, please, Richard. Thanks so much. <clears throat> yeah, so I don't have slides to, sh to, to share today. Um, um, after a lot of virtual conferences, I thought, you know, it's actually quite nice to um i found it better to talk like more personally but i think that was an inspiring presentation um so just to give a bit of background to where we're from and and what we do open cities lab is a uh, non-profit organization that works out of south africa um working throughout the continent now uh, especially trying to build participatory democracy and inclusion um through working directly with uh, government, but also with communities. Um, and part of what we really want to do is empower people to use information um, and knowledge to uh, understand and access their uh, what their rights are and, and understand how to engage um, systems of governance um, and power in order to find out you know, how to improve their situations. So this project that we did um we we evolved from the term of community of citizen science to community science um and uh what we really wanted to understand is could we start to teach people to create their own um ability to collect data so just you know a, a background open city lab is not um is not a community science organization by default. What we try to do is, is work on, you know, informed decision-making and we, so as civic technologists, um, we engaged, uh, you know, universities and other types of experts within this, in this space. Um, and one of the contexts around South Africa is that apart, apartheid spatial planning meant that a lot of, um, poorer communities uh, are located very close to industrial areas um, and there is an environmental 
uh, racism ultimately within um, and classism uh, that I think we all probably can relate to when we, especially when talking about, um, I don't actually know that it's special to the global South. Um, I think it's uh, typically, you know, one finds the urban planning is based on access, you know, people with access and power. And so what we did is we wanted to teach and create an ecosystem where children and parents uh, were able to, especially within this context, measure their own information. And especially, uh, you know, when it comes to, as we're saying in the city of Durban, poor communities were, were like the way that apartheid special planning happened was that these poor communities were, were located very, uh, very close to petrochemicals um, uh, industry and heavy, dirty industry. And so uh, that's how we evolved, you know, we sort of went through and understood that one of the key issues uh, that they were facing was air quality. Um, and so that's, you know, the idea around this uh, project came from that. And what we wanted to do, and we continue to do, uh, is teach people to make their own air quality sensors. So uh, we've been working on a low cost, as low cost as possible solution. And after this chat, I'll share some links around our methodology and the challenges and, and some of the ways we're working. Um, but what we essentially uh, did was engage uh, university mentors, so students uh, to create, and people that were working either in environmental science and journalism to work with school children to create, build low cost air quality sensors, and then start to tell stories around what they, what they were finding out. So the whole methodology is, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to get people interested in civic tech or science. Um, and one of the, one of the most important things that we've found or the lessons we've learned has been around how to engage people in the narrative. And one of the things people I think really can care about is their, you know, is their context, the context of the children. Um, and, and, you know, so instead of sort of going with a very technical, you know, often, you know, or even talking about air quality, I think one of the, the important things we started to do and so we started to work with these communities in the south Durban basin so in south africa on the east coast of south africa um was start to try and engage storytelling and narrative and games um around information and data and um it was a, a, you know quite an interesting collaborative efforts and we found one of the most important things about it was building collaboration because so we would go in with uh, journalism and environmental science um, students from universities who would become mentors to children in high school age and also at a primary school age so in South Africa those are sort of the you know I think we've all sort of probably got some equivalents of that but typically children ages between eight and ten and then sort of uh, in their teens um, and with different methodologies focusing on um, how information can tell stories and so uh, we engaged in environmental and other um, civil society organizations, but also interested community scientists uh, to put up air, these air quality sensors that we were sort of you know, promoting to build these low cost air quality sensors across the city. So that when we went in and built these sensors and let the children actually see these sort of the technology and the, you know, they put them together and then all of a sudden this information started to feed through around um, air quality. They could also see across the city what was happening, you know, just the maps and colors and things that um, sort of started to say, oh, well, why is, you know, the color coming from our sensor orange or red versus the one that's sort of in that area green? Um, and obviously it had to be, we were very cognizant of focusing on the different sort of ages of children and what they're in.
Oh, I think we might have lost Richard temporarily. Hopefully Richard will come back in a minute. Um, yeah, I can see every, oh, oh, there we are. Hello, Richard, you're back again. <laughs> oh, did I, when did I leave? Sorry. Uh, yeah. You just froze when you were talking about the different colors of the sensors that they could okay. see their difference. Yeah. So we only lost a little bit. Um, My apologies. Yeah. No worries. Um, I'll, so, um, yeah, just teaching around colors and and those sorts of things um, led to essentially the importance of of building storytelling and narrative uh, in a way that children could access around things like discrimination, um, planning, being able to own your own information, engage with governments um, around you, you know key like issues that are going to really be important um so yeah just wrapping up i think you know one of the uh, one of the things that was really difficult was the pandemic because obviously this is a very hands-on project um and uh so we've had a mo had a moment where we've had to sort of try to take it online and typically with low-income communities and children that's not something that's possible so we're sort of building back into that um but I think, what we, you know, there's been some real um, beginnings of impact. And the biggest story for me is that I don't think, you know, I think people often underestimate uh, children and young people and youth. And what was always just like just mind blowing about this project was how quickly concepts were understood, how exciting, uh, you know, youth and children found um, engaging with technology and i think the message you know i think you know based on what i understood from other content in this i think the main message i wanted to bring was um we don't have to leave it to someone else we can put the power into citizen residents children's hands and if we're working uh in terms of cities for children and especially on this topic of equality uh you know you can do it directly with uh the, the you know the people that that you're trying to work with um, and uh, build a, a new generation of citizen scientists and citizen activists uh, and people that will go into government uh, and people that will go into private industry and people that will, you know, understand that they have the ability to make better informed choices because they can directly work with information and data, uh, but especially just starting on you know, understanding how to build narrative and how to connect to people where they are, children where they are, what they're interested in, uh, and build uh, a, a methodology through that. So I'll share some links in the chat. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Richard. That was really, um, also really inspiring. Thank you. And really nice bringing that angle of storytelling um, in as well. Thank you. We're going to move over to Jack now, who's going to talk about UNICEF's, um, Mon UNICEF Mongolia's work on air quality. So Jack, I know you do have slides. Um, so if you could share your slides and we will check that they're working. That would be fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, we can see it. It's not full screen at the minute, but um, we can certainly see something, Jack. Uh, That's it. Full yeah, fabulous. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, just would like to briefly share our experience in monitoring and improving air quality for children in Mongolia. So, my name is Jack, and I have a full name. Uh, you may not wish to pronounce it, so I will just go with my nickname. And just to set this thing, uh, I'd like to just share how bad air quality in Mongolia, and especially in the capital city, uh, Ulaanbaatar, which is known as one of the coldest capital and one of the most polluted cities in the world. So, for example, if you can see on the left hand, you can see the uh, daily air pollution levels in Ulaanbaatar in the capital. And as you can see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, in most of the, the urban centers, uh, the air pollution exceeds WHO guidelines uh, 20 to 50 times, you know, higher than the threshold set by the, the WHO. 
So it really shows that how the air quality, how bad this air, our air quality in, uh, in not only in capital but also in other provincial centers. So, uh, so that uh, just would like to share with you also why we UNICEF get involved in this area. Air pollution is not traditionally uh, our you know core mandate, but uh, because there was very very little or no progress in the country. And nobody was supporting and supporting the children. So maternal and child health crisis were uh, dramatically increasing because of the air pollution. And then, of course, we also shared previous our previous speakers and our uh, moderator also shared uh, how bad it's for uh, how bad air, air pollution is for brain development, education, equity issues. So that's why taking, uh, you know, considering our comparative advantages, this is also taking our responsibility, UNICEF get involved into uh, air pollution uh, issues. And in, uh, uh, in getting involved in this area, we uh, mainly focused on four or five uh, key areas. So first, you know, uh, like previous speakers mentioned, uh, generating data and evidence and uh, uh, for uh, advocating and communicating for cleaner air, and se second the area that our focus was, you know, reducing the exposure because we wanted to see also real time example of how uh, we want to demonstrate the government and public how uh, you know uh, uh, exposure can be reduced uh, uh, to risks uh, of for maternal and child health, improve indoor air quality. And at the provincial level, we focused on uh, creating a, a, a clean air action plan for, for community level interventions. Of course, the youth engagement is a, is a, is a UNICEF, our uh, you know, uh, core mandate is also youth engagement and empowerment. So we focused on youth engagement. And we focused, uh, lastly, uh, but not least, we focused on policy dialogues and integration. Uh, uh, of air quality, air uh, quality issues into more broader development uh, policy dialogues, because we see that you know air quality is not only a single, but not only an issue for or environmental sector or or health sector. We we think it's more broader uh, development issue. So that's why we focus on, as I mentioned, that and evidence. We mainly focused on collecting and generating Mongolia, the country specific data generation, and academic and research partnership. Of course, the using the data we generated will be used in, and inform the policy, advocacy, and capacity building and community outreach. And in terms of uh, maternal and child health care service, we uh, also help the government and uh, national and local governments to develop a air pollution preparedness plan and also community-based maternal uh, and child care, uh, uh, child care uh, concept was introduced as a, as a part of our effort. And all the medical uh, medical universities in Mongolia who's graduating are, 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 are we also focused on integrating the air quality issues into the uh, environmental pollution, pollution curriculum. So uh, I think that were the main focus. So in terms of improving indoor air quality, we demonstrated, we piloted and demonstrated a number of projects in kindergartens to improve indoor air quality, healthcare centers, kindergartens, and schools by you know retrofitting and ventilation and indoor air quality monitoring system. Because most of these you know uh, buildings are very well old, very uh, poor insulated, so uh, we focus on uh, our more administration projects, how this can be improved. And of course, this will be accompanied with also training and the capacity building activities of, you know, building of the administrators, uh, administrators and teachers. And not only also the demonstration projects, because we also work with the Ministry of Construction in order to develop to uh, uh, revise and introduce new building uh, codes on building design and planning of kindergarten schools and health facilities because the, every year you know, uh, a national and local government uh, 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 constructs uh, a number of uh, you know uh, kindergartens in schools and health facilities so if we could start from the designing and drawing and the 
we could, uh, you know, if we could put the requirement that considers indoor air quality and also ventilation system. So that's why we focus on these areas. And in terms of uh, monitoring, we focus, uh, we tested, you know, many types uh, for both indoors and outdoors. Of course, there are some advantages and disadvantages for uh, there were advantages for every device. But for the indoor, we selected the air visual IQ or air visual pro for indoor networks because of the, the advantage that this device can bring. And then this uh, indoor air quality uh, data were mapped into a, a public, uh, a publicly open uh, a platform, and so that you can see, uh, you know, if my uh, children is going to school number, let's say one. 102 and then what's the indoor air quality there and so then we the, of course with the tips you know uh, how to protect their kids and then uh, at the policy level we focused at the provincial level focused on clean air action plan this is an example of what we did for our, our province so we helped that government to uh, develop a four-year clean air action plan and also introduced our a flagship product, which is called cooking, heating, and insulation products and service. In short, we call it the chips. So, which basically replace uh, the coal burning stoves with the electric heating and better insulation. And then, of course, we help with air quality monitoring, retrofitting, we mentioned, and community advocacy and uh, maternal and child health care. So this is just an, uh, an example of uh, a, a, a very robust uh, uh, reference station that we installed in uh, one of the provinces. Uh, it's, uh, a reference station is uh, placed uh, uh, to uh, measure the uh, ambient air pollution. And this is an example of also low cost air pollution uh, uh, sensor, uh, low cost air pollution, uh, low cost. Uh, air quality monitoring devices we installed throughout the country and this helps us also uh, to measure PM 2.5. I think like uh, uh, in many other developing countries, uh, you know, uh, the PM uh, 2. Uh, measuring PM 2.5 is not really uh, available. So for example, before our program, uh, only there were only uh, four or five cities where uh, we were able to measure PM 2.5. Now at least uh, uh, 21 provinces are able to measure PM 2.5 with this low cost network we established. Of course, youth engagement is, I mentioned, uh, the main uh, uh, youth engagement activity focused on uh, youth uh, 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 empowerment so that you know, the youth can influence the local decision makers. So in the other, uh, on the right hand corner, you can see that teens are advocating for clean air in Mongolia and measuring and influencing the policy makers and so on. And of course, into integration into uh, 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 integrating air quality issues into uh, broader development policy levels. We, for example, this is uh, uh, just a few examples of uh, our uh, efforts. Uh, for example, we uh, integrated air quality issues into the action plan for implementation of the Mongolia's nationally determined contribution and the Paris Agreement and action plan for the National Environmental Health Program and also Green Loan. And we were together with the government of Mongolia, we were able to uh, you know, uh, uh, include our product for eligible, uh, the Green Loan eligible product and national codes I mentioned, Clean Air Action Plan as I also mentioned. I think. Well, I think uh, uh, this is sort of a summary. I think our uh, 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 country office uh, mainly focused because the lessons learned and best practice out of this four or five years program was because we see, we work with a multi sector, uh, 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 you know, uh, experts, health, air pollution, energy, community, uh, uh, communication for development, youth engagement, education, social protection, all these aspects were covered. And we were also to able to influence the government on its mandate and commitment and partnerships, of course, for visibility and buying to access resources. Expertise were one of the, uh, I think, significant success factor, I guess. And of course, you know, uh, without the government or national or local government financial contribution, we were not able to 
not been successful to achieve this results. Uh, so the leveraging finance from the national and local government or financing a uh, number of projects is, is one of the important things. And policy advocacy and community behaviors. Uh, so these were, uh, I would say, the highlight success factors. Thank you. I hope I managed on time. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Jack. I think um, what your, your case study really nicely demonstrated is the impact that you can have at lots of different levels in society if you're working together in that really holistic cross-sectoral way that you described. Um, that comes to the end of our presentation, so we're going to move on to questions now. Um, so there's a few coming in the chat screen and we had a few in in advance. Um, I'm going to read from my book down here. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask, which um, we'll direct at Loretto, please, which is um, what role can parents um, or carers of children play in protecting children from air pollution? Well, um, difficult questions because uh, some, I think that the, it's, it's what we have been doing, it's a difficult question because sometimes we come with so many, it's a baggage of cultural, um, um beliefs you know and and behaviors so but what it has been working a lot is through as we can try to uh, get into the community through the preschools when we work hand by hand with the teachers and we train the teachers and they understand what the data what, how they can see the data what the data means you know and 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 what they can do inside of their of their educational establishment and they when they teach uh, and they involve parents in this process of uh, making changes and, and learning about air pollution because air pollution, people is like, when, when they have like problem with water, everybody's like, oh, you, they run, right? But air pollution, people sti still don't make the, 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 change, the change of mind. So when you work with teachers and the teachers, they empower themselves with the knowledge and they teach themselves again to the community and the parents and they bring together in different activities, children with parents. I think that's when we really can, can make a change in a, in, a, in, a, in a micro scale. In a bigger scale is different, but for this, that is a hyper-local measurement and we're working in, in, we're, um, in, a, in, a, in territories. I think that's a very good way to to make understand the parents and to so and push them to make to learn more about the subject and for example ask what we do also in the training is ask the local governments if there are programs of uh, for changing the type of heating and the, um, for refer the furbishing how to say um, to refurbishing um, yeah yeah the the homes so. Yeah. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. And it kind of links to another question that we had submitted in advance, which is we've heard a lot about how children can get involved in the monitoring of air pollution through, for example, the low cost sensors, Richard, that you described. Um, but how can we meaningfully engage children in reducing the air pollution in cities? Is that is that something that children can meaningfully get involved in um, as as children? Or is that something, as Loretta was describing, it's more related to actions that their teachers can take? Um, I don't know, Jack, do you have anything you'd like to say on that? Oh, you're muted, Jack. Sorry. Well, I think there's uh, a certain limitation when it comes to what children can do to reduce their pollution. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's a shared uh, our, our approach uh, with uh, youth engagement that, you know, uh, uh, bringing them together, educating and empowering them helps also to influence, you know, uh, uh, local authorities. So. Uh, you know, uh, involving them in measuring the air quality and then bringing them to the decision makers would help really make a difference. Yeah, those children can be a powerful lobbying voice, can't they? Richard, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think, I mean, just something that we've learned uh, time over is that one of the ways of dealing with apathy uh, is uh, to to engage children who have a natural curiosity 
and 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 if as i said if you can connect um concepts around like big things like democracy and inclusion and participation um i don't think i think we underestimate children you're not going in with that sort of a perspective but i think there's there's really a good opportunity to make this the future citizens of of this world and the people that will care about um their context and making a better you know environment and climate mm -hmm. we should be doing that immediately and mm -hmm. funny enough often when you get children interested in something it helps lead to parents and teachers being interested in something um yeah and and so i think you know as i said there's a lot around our project and this is obviously limited time but one of the main messages is just don't underestimate the power of what youth can do and yeah. i think that I, i you know there's a huge role for uh i don't think it, you know don't burden children with it but like getting people excited about a better, better clean air is mm. an awesome thing and yeah. linking it to a better future yeah yeah and the vast majority of the world's children do go to school and so schools you have a sort of captive audience it's a good way of reaching a large number of people who as you say Richard are going to be the decision makers of the future aren't they so um yeah thank you I think that's really inspiring so we are going to wrap up now and um, there were a few questions um, that we haven't had time to answer so panelists if there's anything you feel you haven't answered if you want to do that in the chat screen um quickly now that would be fabulous um so one thing i wanted to just kind of close with i found that i found those session this session really inspiring um so as a final exercise i'd like all of those listening along um to kind of think about a pledge or a promise or a commitment something that you're going to do having heard today's session and it could be I'm just going to have a look at some of those great links that people have put in the chat screen or I'm going to have a look at UNICEF Mongolia's work in more detail or whatever. Or it could be, you know, I'm going to start an air quality monitoring project in my children's school, whatever, like a small or large. So if you could kind of think about a pledge or a promise that you'd like to make um, and pop something in the chat screen, that would be fabulous. Um, Whilst you're um, thinking about that, um, I'm just going to pass over to um, Nikita because I think Nikita's got a few things she'd like to say um, as we close. Thank you, Sarah, for so beautifully moderating the entire session and to our panelists for highlighting such inspiring, uh, you know, examples and work that you've been doing in your respective cities and countries. Um, to all the participants, thank you for joining in. Uh, I have a small request. We are going to, uh, you know, a small survey is going to pop up on your windows once this meeting closes. I request you to fill in. I promise it will not take more than a minute and uh, it will help us curate, you know, better webinars and information sessions for you in the future uh, and also the recording of the session is going to be available we'll send you a short and sweet email when it's ready and then you can pass it along to all your colleagues and uh, people in your network thank you so much for joining in today and have a good day